I'd like to call to order this joint special meeting, Raton City Commission and Raton Water Board. Could we have a roll call of the members of the City Commission and the Raton Water Board, please, Desiree? Sure. Mayor Sagata? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Schuster? Present. Commissioner Chavez? Present. Commissioner Giacomo? Present. Commissioner Chatterley? Present. Commissioner Gallardi? Here. Commissioner Litchfield? Here. Commissioner Morris? Here. Liaison Schuster? Here. And liaison Chavez. Here. All righty. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this special meeting between the Raton City Commission and the Raton Water Works. This is in regards to the Lake Dorothy Wildlife Area. And we have with us tonight Mr. Mike Brown. He's going to give us a presentation on this proposed area. Mr. Brown. Um, so I've got some handouts for everybody. Sure. Great. Um, kind of talks about some of the frequently asked questions with our state wildlife areas, a lot of the different fees and everything that are associated with that, as well as a new app that's available for our cell phones where you can actually purchase licenses, you know, on an iOS or Android device. Um, I didn't anticipate, I guess, this big of a turnout. I think I've got 25 copies of each. We can get some more, so man. I can make a few copies. Okay. Perfect. I'll give you those, and then. Uh, just go ahead and kind of stand over here and, and talk and then be able to address the Commission Water Board and all of our constituents here tonight. So, are you uh, going to need a slideshow presentation or? Yeah, if somebody can run that. The guy behind you. Yeah, yeah that arrow key. Or I can try and multitask while he makes we copies. Can. <laughs> oh, you can. Yeah, he's got it. We got it, I think. Okay, great. So my name is Mike Brown. I'm the Area Wildlife Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, which used to be the Colorado Division of Wildlife, located out of Area 11, which is Pueblo. Um, my geographic, I guess, uh, oversight or supervisory responsibilities is, you know, everything in Custer County from the top of the Sangre de Cristos, uh, clear out to the Pueblo-Crowley uh, County line, and then basically the New Mexico line all the way to El Paso County. So. I'm not really at home here in New Mexico, right? <laughs> um, but glad to be here tonight to talk to you guys about Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area. I'm sure all of you have been there before. You probably recognize that picture. Um, so not actually owned by us. This is a property that we have leased um, through the city of Raton historically since 1980. Go ahead. And this is kind of our mission of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, probably similar to New Mexico Game and Fish, right? And it says, basically, we're here to perpetuate the wildlife resources of the state, provide a quality state park system, and provide enjoyable outdoor recreation opportunities to include hunting, fishing, angling, wildlife viewing, to go ahead and educate and inspire our current and future generations and make sure that we're getting active stewards of our natural resources, okay? We have the unique ability, I think, to extend that into New Mexico with this lease, which is really cool. Um, but that's our basic mission. Go ahead. Keep going. Go all the way through it. So this is kind of a breakdown of our wildlife funding in Colorado. Um, I'm not really sure how it works in New Mexico, but we don't receive any type of tax dollars, right? So we don't get any tax money. All of our money comes strictly from hunting and fishing license revenue which makes up the largest percentage um, of our revenue that comes in. So we're kind of a self-enterprise agency. So that's a 71% makeup of our total revenue. We get a little bit of interest, you know, based on what we invest at 3%. And then the other breakdown of that is there's some federal aid at 14% and then some federal grants and Great Outdoor Colorado uh, money or funding at 10% of our budget. Um, so anytime you guys buy, you know, hunting or fishing equipment, or anything like that. If you go back to like the Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson acts that were set up, um, you know, in the U.S., a, a certain percentage of those fees go back to sporting goods equipment, and we see some of that from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, kind of comes back, or it's reappropriated to all the different states, and that's not just Colorado, right? That's across the whole U.S. Next slide. 
So the first thing we ask is what is a state wildlife area, right? So a state wildlife area in Colorado is basically a property that we either own in fee title, that we've taken money via license fees or habitat stamp dollars to then go ahead and purchase a property to go ahead and provide sportsmen, you know, or outdoor recreationists the ability to have increased opportunities, or in this case, right, unique to the city of Raton, it's a property that we actually lease, okay? And so throughout the state of Colorado, there's over 350 different state wildlife areas that we either own and lease in full, okay? And it's for the members of the public to enjoy wildlife-related recreation. Um, so the original intent, you know, if you look at that first bullet point, is to go ahead and actually restore, conserve, manage, and enhance wildlife and wildlife habitat. Um, that's, that's their, their first basis, their, you know, what they're responsible for. There's a lot of confusion, you know, especially when we merged with Colorado State Parks as to why we don't provide a lot of the same park opportunities, right? Well, again, we try to conserve these properties specifically for wildlife, wildlife habitat, and wildlife-related recreation. So they're not intended to be a state park. And this goes back to, if you look at the first state wildlife area that was enacted in 1881, um, the importance and the mission of that was actually set back then, demonstrating Colorado's commitment to conservation and protection of wildlife species. Um, so I always say, you know, the, the theme, you know, with the North American model of wildlife conservation, it's, it's for people, for wildlife, but it starts with people, right, and it helps fund wildlife. And so if it wasn't for hunters and anglers, we wouldn't have the wildlife species that we have today, the properties that we have today, and it's all through, you know, sports persons contributing to that, either through a license purchase or through buying gear. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Next slide. So what's the purpose of a state wildlife area? And that first bullet point kind of goes into, you know, this coming from our wildlife commission in Colorado. And it says it's the intent of a wildlife commission that in accordance with state law, state wildlife areas be acquired and managed for the preservation and conservation of wildlife and their habitat, and to also provide wildlife related recreation opportunities to the public so long as such uses are compatible with wildlife and habitat management goals. And so that second bullet point kind of talks about all those different goals and what we try to do for wildlife and how to manage them, right? And I'll just go over it real quick. So it's habitat protection, conservation and management protection, the habitat enhancement, restoration and management of aquatic and terrestrial habitat, and making sure that that's obviously very critical, you know, for the conservation of that on a wildlife area. So think about it, right? If we were just to open up a property and we were to allow every type of use to happen on that property, we couldn't protect the habitat that makes it unique to those wildlife species that call it home, right? It would be degraded, it would be fragmented, and then you're left with nothing, right? And then with that, then there's no ability to, to fish or hunt or have watchable wildlife recreation opportunities. So that's kind of our base, you know, mission or purpose behind wildlife areas and why they're established. Next slide. Um, so state wildlife areas in Colorado, right, they're intended to provide for recreation in the form of hunting, fishing, trapping, um, as well as watchable wildlife use and enjoyment of all different species. Um, some different state wildlife areas are actually closed or posted against recreational use if there's a conflict with critical habitat or wildlife activities, right? So, you know, we look at threatened and endangered species, you know, we look at, let's say, greater sage grouse, Gunnison sage grouse, we try to protect those leks where they breed, where they mate. Um, we look at where deer and elk and antelope, you know, are actually born. We try to protect those reproduction areas. You know, we try to protect winter range. We try to conserve the timing periods that are associated with that to make sure that those animals aren't being disrupted. And that's all tied into kind of our basis or our purpose. Um, you know, basic needs of wildlife, right? Nesting, breeding, wintering, spawning, and rearing type of thing. Next slide. So kind of unlike national forests or state parks, right, state wildlife areas are not designed for multi-use recreation. Um, this is where it differs from a state park, right? And a lot of people, if you go to a state park, you'll see, 
you know, that those places are fully developed for multiple types of recreation, but it's not always designed around wildlife management and conservation, okay? Um, there are exceptions across Colorado um, where there are different wildlife areas that do have multi-use recreation on them. We do look at that and we take it on a case-by-case -case basis, okay, and we have to be careful on how we do that, again, because we don't want to hurt the wildlife species that are there or the habitat or disrupt the opportunity that people have on those properties. Um, so, you know, it says here if they're permitted, when they're supportive of, incidental to, or compatible with wildlife recreation, you know, that's something that we might actually allow, right? So camping, picnicking, hiking, those are things that generally don't have a, a huge, huge impact. Um, the thing that we're seeing, I guess, statewide, and this is a kind of national trend with outdoor recreation, is there's more and more people that want to be outside, that want to recreate, right? And it's not just hunters, it's not just anglers, trappers, or wildlife watchers. It's people that want to hike and bike, you know, and take photographs and just be outside, right? And if we look at COVID and what happened with COVID, even our own governor in Colorado encouraged everybody to get outside. And so what did we see? We actually seen people just coming out to our wildlife areas and just flooded them. We've seen increased exponential use that we've never seen before, okay? Now keep in mind, anywhere that you go to recreate, right, if you go to a concert, um, if you go to a film festival, if you go to a movie, uh, you know, a race, uh, a state park, all those places you have to pay to recreate. Well, historically in Colorado, all of our state wildlife areas were free, all right? But they were paid for by hunting and fishing license dollars through the habitat stamp fee in the RFP process, but really all the other different users that went there to recreate, you know, weren't contributing to that system. And so our Wildlife Commission, our legislators, and our agency looked at all this, and we said, okay, you know, this is something that we need to take note of and, and think about how we try to fix it, right? And with that exponential increase, you know, in demand and people coming to these wildlife areas, we actually changed regulations in, in 2020 uh, to make sure that people had to have a qualifying license to be on a state wildlife area. Um, and that's in line with most other western states, you know, across the U.S. Um, again, you know, you got to pay to play. And so a lot of people were upset about that because they're like, well, what if I don't hunt or what if I don't fish or what if I don't trap? What's in it for me? So following that legislation in 2020, in 2021, we actually created a state wildlife area access permit and that's specific just to people that want to go ahead and watch wildlife or, you know, take into account some of the non-consumptive uses that may be offered on some of these wildlife areas, such as picnicking or hiking. Next slide. And, and that's what we've seen. Um, now, this is kind of going back to, you know, some of the other different types of non-wildlife related recreation um, that we've seen and the different examples that we take into account. Um, obviously, we try to allow this even if it's not quite in line with the intent of a wildlife area and what we do, but we try to make sure that the property is still being managed for the main purpose of, of what it was acquired for or leased for, um, that maintenance costs don't significantly rise or increase, the activity doesn't cause any type of habitat damage or degradation, right? We don't want to disrupt that landscape or hurt it in any way. And it doesn't prevent protection of wildlife species during critical portions of their life cycle. Um, or it doesn't prevent any type of our management goals from being met. You know, so we try to manage our wildlife, um, you know, through harvest, our game species anyway. And if we're implementing something that would go against that, um, it, it's going to hurt that population over time. Um, Common examples of a lot of this, I mentioned this earlier, right, that we see, you know, different requests, swimming, sailboarding, <coughs> water skiing, off-road use, motorized trail biking, um, normal biking, and hiking. And we try to look at those, and if we can integrate that stuff into a wildlife area and we say, hey, it's not going to impact some of those main things, you know, we try to allow that stuff, right? And that's just kind of being in line with the times of where we are and the trends in outdoor recreation. Next slide. So a lot of questions that I get, um, 
and this is kind of on that fact sheet, and they'll probably have somebody pass those out if they would. Once we, we created that regulation um, to require licenses, you know, the first thing that people always ask is, well, what does it cost, right? And a lot of people are like, oh, I imagine it's a ton of money. Well, really, you know, for, for an annual fishing license, um, or excuse me, for an annual state wildlife area access pass, $36.08. Um, not a ton of money, right? I can't fill up my pickup for that $36.08. <laughs> today's gas prices, right? One day, if you only wanted to go for one day. That's in-state or out-of-state? That's out-of-state or in-state. <laughs> Plus $10. Plus 1040 No. No, no that, that includes it. Um, the one-day license, $9 if you're a youth ages 16 to 17. Um, under that, we don't require it, right? But if you're in that category, annual fee of, of $10.07. I don't know if you can go to the movies for that cost, right? Um, and just so you guys know, these are all on our website and in our brochures too if, if you're worried about me going over it too quick or you want that information later. Low income annual, $10.07. Um, so these fees include a $1.50 wildlife education fund surcharge. And then that habitat stamp money, again, is, is added onto that, so $10.40. Um, next slide. And then here's kind of the examples and the costs of a fishing license, right? If you chose to buy that and you're going to fish in Colorado and you want to use that to be able to access the state wildlife area. If you're a resident, um, an adult, ages 18 to 64, $36.71. Um, compare that to a non-resident, you know, annual fishing license, that's $102.40. Uh, senior annual fishing for folks 65 or older in state residents, $10.23. Um, youth resident age 16 to 17, $10.23. And then the combo resident fishing and small game license, $52.60. Um, the senior small game and fishing combo for 65 plus, $31.03. Um, I'm just going to stop real quick and I'll make a plug on those license costs, right? And I want you guys to think about this. So in our hatchery section, which I do not oversee, but just the cost to raise and rear like one rainbow trout to a catchable size, which is 8 to 10 inches, you're looking at $1.22 to $1.44. You know, so if you fish, you know, it quickly adds up and you can look at those license costs and it kind of makes sense, right, over time. If it wasn't for our hunting uh, program in Colorado, I think our fishing license fees would be much more higher, or much more significant. Um, going back to the non-resident category, if you wanted to buy a five-day fishing license in Colorado, uh, $33.53. The one-day fishing uh, would be $14.46 for a resident, and for a non-resident, it'd be $17.64. And so, you know, you could buy a one-day, a five-day, or an annual license, and that's a qualifying license that would give you the ability to be on any state wildlife area. Um, next slide. Alternatively, if you wanted to go and actually get a small game license um, because you like to bird hunt or chase rabbits, you know, or pheasants or chucker or quail or whatever, you also have that ability, uh, which then gives you the ability to also be on a state wildlife area. So we'll kind of compare some of those costs as well. So for a resident, um, ages 18 to 64, uh, $31.41. A one-day license would be $14.46. The senior small game fishing combo, uh, again, $31.03. The youth small game and fur bearer, $1.23. Um, the small game and fishing combo, $52.60. And then for non-residents, right, out of state, you could buy that annual license for $86.50. Um, one day would be $17.64, and an additional day for $7.05. Next slide. So I often get the, you know, the next probably most frequent question is, you know, where do I get a license? You know, how can I get that in place? So any license agent, um, you know, that sells sporting good equipment or has one of our licensing terminals 
whether it's internally with us being Colorado Parks and Wildlife, or let's say Big R, Walmart, a local sporting goods store, any one of those places can actually go ahead and print that. Um, I realize the day and age that we're in, that's not always convenient, right? So we actually adopted the ability to go ahead and purchase that stuff on your cell phone. And I think that handout is going around that talks about how to do that. So you can go ahead and set up that profile and any license that isn't a carcass tag uh, license, you know, requiring you to tag an animal after you bag it can be purchased on that website. Um, in addition to state park pass stuff too as well. It's not just wildlife licenses. Um, pretty neat because then you can store that on your phone and everybody has their phone with them right wherever they go. And so if you're checked in the field, you can say, yeah, here, you know, here's my license, here's proof of it, you can save it. You can have multiple people's profiles on one app, uh, pretty cool. If you don't wanna go that route, you can you know, jump on the internet um, on mycpwshop.com and you can buy those licenses there as well. Um, pretty cool stuff, you know, so there's increased flexibility on how to get that. Um, pretty neat. I know when I was young and growing up, we didn't have, you know, the internet and the ability to do all that on a smartphone. It was an old paper license and you better have it on you, right? So kind of cool with technology and the advancements that it's uh, provided us with. Next slide. Oh, go back one. Yeah. Keep going back. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, I'll stop you when you get there. <laughs> For that app, does it require an active network connection to pull up the licenses, or can you save them as PDFs? No, you can save them, yep. Thank you. But you will have to have an active internet connection to get on the CPW shop to buy it. Understood. Yep. Um, keep going back. I think you went the wrong way. <laughs> Can we help you? So that's kind of an example of what that app looks like, and I know that's really hard to read, uh, given I'm, I'm trying to fit this in the frame of the PowerPoint presentation, and I know for folks in the back row, you're probably squinting and trying to see it, right? But what it does is it provides the person's individual information, their CID number, which is their unique nine-digit number with us, which is kind of almost like a social security number, even though it's not. It personally identifies you in our database. Um, shows you what licenses you have, you know, gives you information on what you bought, the date you bought it, um, and then kind of a barcode. So pretty cool. Next slide. There's again a, another great picture of Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area. Um, next slide. Here's a actual map that shows Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area. Uh, again, that we lease from the city of Raton, as well as the James M. John State Wildlife Area that Parks and Wildlife actually owns in fee title. Um, pretty neat, if you go onto our website, you can actually pull up all the different 350 plus state wildlife areas across the state. You can click on them. You can pull up an interactive map. It'll show you all the different features that are on that map. You can save it. You can look at the property specific regulations for that. Um, and kind of navigate through and so I just wanted to throw that on there and kind of educate folks about it Kind of show you those features next slide Here it kind of talks about um, the different regulations You know for Lake Dorothy and the James M. John State Wildlife Area and then kind of gives you an overall view of, of the map and and where that's at next slide and so now getting into this right and this is a uh, kind of, I guess, our, our lease renewal. And there's been a lot of questions. I know this has seen a lot of publicity probably here in, in Raton as well as in Colorado. Um, going back to 1980, right, we've had this lease. And this lease renewal came up and we've been negotiating it 
you know, with the idea that we wanted to try to offer increased opportunities for public recreation um, while still balancing kind of the needs of wildlife and wildlife management. But for those of you that don't know, um, you know, Lake Dorothy is a really, really neat property, 4,800 acres, um, you know, tons of oak brush, um, ponderosa pine, you get some aspen, some dug fir, clear up high, obviously the, the watershed or water source, you know, for this area. Got a 10 acre lake and a three miles of different stream kind of running through it. Um, and then includes the Colorado portion of, of Lake Maloya. So pretty neat place, especially given the drastic increase in elevation, the multitude of species that you have from, you know, black bear to mule deer to elk, um, you know, songbirds. Um, don't know if there's any potential threatened or endangered species on that property. I, maybe there is, I don't know. <laughs> but pretty. That's, that's, that's on Fisher's Peak State Park, which is confirmed. Uh, probable, but I can't confirm that for sure on Lake Dorothy because we haven't actually done any trapping events to, to confirm that, right? So we shall see, right, if that were to happen in the future. Next slide. Um, kind of as I mentioned, right, trying to provide increased recreation opportunities. And I make a, re a reference, I guess, to attachment C, which is a trails map that myself and, and Scott Berry and his team kind of work together with to look at trying to provide some increased hiking and biking opportunities. And we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, and then also, you know, we've had this conversation about putting in more signs on that property to give you guys or any, any constituent or user the ability to know what's going on, right, with information on how to buy that qualifying license and some of that same information that's going on in that handout. That's all stuff that we would like to include or post on that place, um, just to make sure everybody's in the know. And then the one thing we also talked about too um, in kind of working through this lease is developing a management plan uh, between us and the city of Ratone, you know, kind of highlighting the different wildlife or recreational uses on the property. And then looking at how that balances, you know, with winter range, calving areas, um, all that sort of thing, right? And that's going back to the basis or purpose of wildlife areas, why we acquire them, why we manage them, conserve them, protect them, et cetera. Um, we jointly agreed to all these changes and probably more that I'm not thinking of right off the top of my head. It's a pretty lengthy document, right? But that's kind of the, the summary or the highlight of it. Next slide. There's kind of the, uh, the exhibit or the trails map. Um, so if you look, you know, there's, there's current trails that are there already. Um, there's the, the trail that goes around Lake Maloya and then trails A, B, C, and D um, that are kind of scattered throughout that. And so, you know, the things that we talked about um, is, okay, if we allowed this type of recreation to happen on the property, what impacts would there be to wildlife? You know, and it, would it be detrimental? Um, would it be something that we want to do? And so we have to look at that, you know, through a very careful lens. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see, um, you know, for elk that are in the area, this is an overlay um, from our GIS shop that kind of shows our different production areas on where the elk breed on Lake Dorothy. And so right away, you can see where some of the, the heart of those trails get up into that production and that breeding area and potentially could be problematic, but maybe the trail around Lake Maloya isn't, right? Um, next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Let me ask a question. Well, yeah. Go back to that. Yeah. The whole green is the, the same as for the breeding for elk. Yep. Yep. And that's measured via RFID tracking calls. We have actually done that, yes. Um, and so one thing that I can't share. So we actually do have ongoing research on Lake Dorothy for our elk herd in this part of the, the southern extreme end of the state that do have GPS radio collars on them. Those collars update every 24 hours. They give us pinpoint information. And so we take not just, you know, wildlife biologist or wildlife officer information and flight data, but also GPS collar data specific to those animals to kind of show the habitat, the species use, the time frame that they occupy it, and then we create maps to go with it. Um, since it's ongoing research and it's protected against public presentation and any type of CORA request, I can't present color data, but I can show you at least an overlay of the shaded area that coincides with that, if that makes sense. 
Yep. Um, so yeah, that shows the, the production area and the next map. That actually shows, you know, the severe different uh, winter range that's in the area. And what's really unique, you know, not just to Lake Dorothy, but Fisher's Peak and some of the area around it is, you know, those elk will actually not just breed or summer in the area and have their calves in the area, but they'll winter in the area too. And if you look at that kind of as an overall um, view, it's unique in the sense that they don't do that everywhere else on the landscape, right? And so when you think about that from trying to protect species, um, that becomes very, very important for the management of them, right? Next slide. And here it kind of shows that summer concentration area. You can see they end up using the James M. John a heck of a lot more than they do in the winter. Obviously that's an elevation, you know, and habitat component as well. So next slide. Can I ask a question here? Yeah. So you're trying to protect all that land from breeding and the calving of the elk. They only breed, they only give, they only calf for a month. Correct. Why are you protecting them under the lease for six months? For almost six and a half months. So if you look at kind of our standards that we've adopted, you know, through years and years of research, uh, information from district wildlife managers, area wildlife managers like myself and biologists, we establish kind of time frames on when to protect, you know, different big game species. And those come with set different amount of months um, that coincide with that. And so it, it's not just right when they calve, right? But think about that cow elk. If she drops that calf um, kind of the end of May or even first part of June, and let's say, you know, you're developing the property or you're allowing a, a ton of other recreation that you wouldn't ordinarily allow, you know, like motorbikes or hiking or whatever, there's a disruption factor that occurs there. And so what happens is that cow elk will actually leave that calf or that baby and if it's disrupted enough, there's an avoidance factor that comes with it and they'll actually quit utilizing the area, you know, altogether. And there's been, you know, tons of different, I guess, research studies and colored, you know, data studies on animals that illustrate kind of that avoidance that comes with that. And so that's why it's important. It's not just right when they're born, but it's important to conserve them or try to protect them for, for months after until they're old enough to kind of do what they need to do, right? It'd be similar to, let's say, if we went into the hospital with a baby ward right after babies were born, and let's just say we started taking hospital beds out and wheeling babies out of there and separating them from moms, are they going to survive? Sure. They should. What if mom abandons them, though, and they can't eat? Well, I, I, right? think, I think you're comparing apples and well, and it's an analogy, but that's that's the yeah. point I'm trying to make, right, is there is a, a set time frame that's very, very important, that's critical for those animals. And it's not just elk, right? It's deer, it's antelope, it's bears. It's a lot of our different big game species. And so we use those predetermined standards or those time frames, you know, when we make those recommendations for, you know, summer range, winter range, calving areas, extreme winter range. Um, because if you don't, you know, through research and through our management expertise for the 125 years that we've done this, it doesn't work and, and then wildlife loses. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but you know, I've been back here biking, I've been up back there hiking, my wife has been back there hiking. I sure. haven't seen an elk yet since the fire. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't seen any. Um, They're there, I can promise you. Well, maybe further up. I, I'm not, I'm not yeah. talking with you. I'm just saying that I, I just think that the lease, I read the lease that for six months, six and a half months is, is way too much, especially when they only calf for a month. And I, I can understand that we shouldn't be bothering the, the elk or sure. the calfing or, or deer or whatever, but uh, to, to close that down completely for six and a half months, to me that's you're so that, the rights of the, of the people of this county and this town. So that closure isn't just for calving or reproductive areas, right? That's also the winter range as well, right? And so that's, that's that critical part of the year or portion of the year when those animals are at the tail end of the year. They're trying to conserve that body weight. And the more that they're disrupted or they're bothered, the more that they're ran, the more calories that they end up burning. And then their survival rate actually drops or decreases. And so now you talk about impacts not just to an individual but potentially at a population level right 
and that's why you know we've passed different regulations all across Colorado like for shed hunting on the different time frames on when you can actually shed hunt versus when you can and again it's it's tied with that winter range it's not just calving so it's it's looking at the calving period, you know, the summer period, and also that winter period to try to protect them. And, and again, it's, it's not to take away anybody's type of recreation. It's actually to provide the, the best hunting type opportunity that you could later on, maximizing that wildlife population, how we manage it, right? And ensuring the people that do want to view them have a future to view them, right? Because if we didn't do that, what's the alternative, you know? Well, I, let me let me finish my presentation and then I'll I'll take comments before we before we jump off into that. Let's let them so, finish the presentation, please. So obviously, you guys have kind of you know read I guess the lease and and some of the different things that go with that. But yeah, and, and again, you know we've made some considerations on what trails should and shouldn't be open and at what times of the year. And it, it's to protect those species and those animals, right? Um, we've agreed, right, trail A on the map and the trail that goes around Lake Maloya um, could go ahead and be open to foot and equestrian access as well as bicycles. Um, and periodic access restrictions shouldn't be applied to those trails. Um, I think that that's fair, right, because by allowing that and it being far enough down the drainage and far enough down the property, you're not going to have species level impacts or issues to those animals. So let me finish and I'll answer questions. Going into trails B, C, and D, right, if you go back to that map and where they are and how they go into the heads of those drainages and kind of the key um, areas or the, the heart of that habitat, that's some of your, your best stuff that's on that property and that's absolutely necessary to try to protect those animals right so we try to put those access restrictions you know designated around the different hunting seasons and as necessary to protect elk calving and elk wintering um, next slide um, and these are the different recommended time frames for that right so for an elk production area you know we say that it should be close to human activity from may 15th to june 30th of each year and then elk winter concentration areas, you know, from December 1st through April 30th. Next slide. And this is what I say, right? The overall goal, you know, is bringing us together, right? It's Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the city of Raton, and, and trying to balance all those different needs of recreation and provide high quality opportunities for hunters, anglers, and wildlife watchers, and make sure that you know that state wildlife area continues to be a safe haven for wildlife and that protecting the resource should be the primary you know purpose of that lease um, so that that kind of concludes my presentation and then i guess i'll just open it up you know for questions i know i'm sure there's there's a lot of questions there's probably a lot of people that are upset right not only with the fact that my agency implemented the different license costs that are associated with accessing properties or state wildlife areas, but maybe how it looks is being unfair. But keep in mind, again, right, all state wildlife areas, you know, whether they're leased or they're owned by us in fee title, there's there's three main goals behind them, right? They were they were purchased by hunters and anglers, um, and they're they're meant to ensure that there's hunting and angling opportunity in the future, and they're intended to serve as a primary place, you know, as a refuge you know and, and for wildlife habitat and they're, they're supposed to be there for the future of wildlife and so we have to be really careful about what type of recreation we allow and what goes with it and those potential impacts that are associated with it um so i'll go ahead and i'll open it up Mike, before, before you do that can we put the slide back up where the trails and that yeah absolutely yep It was just the one that showed the trails. And I can come help you if you want.
I got a question in the back. Yeah. So thank you for your commitment to conservation. My name is thank Walter. You. I'm the Sugary Canyon superintendent. So it's a state park that I manage, which is different. Uh, we are more aligned with recreational opportunities focused towards our human visitors, if you will. Um, however, we also have a mission very similar to Parks and Wildlife. I'm coming from the Elvado area, which has the Rio Chamo Wildlife Management Area next to it. Predominantly mule deer breeding and herds moving through that valley. What we have seen, uh, and this is in conjunction with my game and fish constituents and uh, warden friends, is not so much uh, um, digging in my vocabulary, but not so much of an interference in human wildlife interaction in the summer months when that area has been opened up. Now granted, they have a lot more uh, restrictive access than I believe this uh, Lake Worthy area, area does. You know, it is horse fencing, barbed wire fencing throughout. OHVs are strictly prohibited. You can go in on horseback. You can use a bicycle, but it is only during a select time of year. They don't have it confined to specific trail use. And so I guess my question is, have you thought about partitioning areas within that Lake Dorothy uh, area where new trails could be potentially assigned or designated that are not going to affect the calving winter areas because obviously those are of great importance, importance for the elk herds? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so myself and, and Scott Berry and his team, we actually did just, just that, right? Okay. Um, we originally started and, and talked about different trails, you know, going into other drainages. Um, and, you know, I, I highly advised against that just, just because of that very same thing, right? And it, and it seems like a small impact. Like you think about a trail going in somewhere and you think, ah, it's not going to hurt anything, right? But if you really, really spend time on the landscape and you fly this country, and you see what the deer and the elk and the bears use in their primary areas and what they like to occupy. You know, there's, there's core habitat where they like to, you know, rest, eat, drink, you know, and, and go about their day. No different than kind of what we do, right? They have a pattern. Um, so we, we basically did just that, and that's a great question. And, uh, I mean, the other reason people don't see a lot of this wildlife is because they don't want to be seen and they, most of them sleep during the day, head down during the day. Yeah. When you're out there, um, that is a reality. But they are there. Right. Most likely you're right on top of them. Um, you know, it, the area I was coming from was a lot of two-track, a lot of human interaction already occurring there. I haven't had the privilege yet of being up in this wildlife area to see it, um, to have a correlation there. But really, it seemed that the human interference factor was minimal when it was opened up to those other recreation activities. Those wildlife management areas I was speaking of are heavy hunting areas. Right. Um, so that season is crucial to not have stress on them. And they really didn't have any data reflecting that stress occurred after they had opened them up to those other recreation opportunities. Could that be different sense. here because of the terrain and um, inability for humans to impact it. But right. I yeah, know that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and then my only other question is, and it's more about your staffing in that area mm -hmm. um, with this lease renewal is there any idea of increasing your staffing presence of either conservation officers support individuals for trail work anything like that um unfortunately no right okay. now yeah. with the passage of our future generations act and you know some of our different license fees and stuff over time we're hoping to get more personnel but as it stands right now, I've got one wildlife officer that covers, you know, that specific area. That's Adam Friedel. Um, that's historically been the case. I think statewide there's a 136 wildlife officers in the state of Colorado. Um, I don't foresee us being able to get any more officers in that area. And then I've got one property technician that's actually in charge of, you know, the upkeep, restroom, maintenance, all that type of thing. And he's not just in charge of, I guess, Lake Dorothy, right? He also has responsibilities on what would be the Bosca del Oso State Wildlife Area that's uh, just outside of Trinidad in western Colorado. So uh, that's the wildlife officer is Adam Friedel. The, the technician that's responsible for maintenance would be uh, Dylan Thompson. Yep. Good question. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When 
When will the elk production areas and uh, elk winter concentration areas uh, be defined? It says that there's going to be a state and city management plan within the six months, but I'm curious to know what you believe uh, in your best bet uh, what those areas are going to be. Is it going to be that whole shaded area that you showed us? Uh, so that the whole area is going to be restricted for those six and a half months, or is it going to be narrowed down, as, as Walter is saying, uh, into smaller uh, geographical areas? Great question. Um, if you go back to the shaded portions of those maps, it is essentially, you know, that that area that we're talking and those so that's the whole that's the whole area right it's a majority of the area yes i didn't see anything that wasn't greened out there's can a little bit of stuff yeah we can go back to that map there's so a little bit of stuff that's right by lake maloya that know, isn't on, included I, in that i'm an avid hiker mm -hmm. i've been hiking there for 35 years uh, okay almost weekly uh, sometimes more than that and initially when i spoke with mr barry in february he thought perhaps there would be uh, a trail, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but it's basically parallel to the Segestrom Trail in Lake Maloya, and it goes south of Bogler's Knob, and that would, that would uh, it almost borders, I think, uh, along the border. That would allow, at the very west end, I believe, access into Fisher's Peak, if, if that very south end trail that Mr. Berry initially had thought might be negotiated with you all uh, would be open to uh, biking. It's, it's literally, uh, if, if it's in Colorado, it's in Colorado by maybe 100 yards. But it starts out in New Mexico in, in uh, the state park and it goes west as far as Bobler's Bobbler's Knob, and and then I'm not sure if it's in Colorado or not. Is that the junction with Opportunity that you're talking about? Uh, it's it's just uh, north of Opportunity okay. Trail okay. and parallel to it. Okay. And I'm I'm wondering if you know where I'm talking about and if that might be a possibility to be excluded from this elk production area and elk winter concentration area. So that trail would end up, I guess, being on the left side of you know the red trail and what lake malloy is yeah kind of you know, somewhere I, in there and then it would end up going up sugarstrom creek is that what you're saying no i mr barry i think you can help me out on this you showed it to me at one point sure. it goes directly due west and then you thought that it might be a little northern jaunt up to the fisher's peak um border of what, what we originally proposed was a trail that that followed Segerstrom through New Mexico, but it, it turned in Colorado, went on the west side of Bobbler's, uh, and uh, it, it could provide a connection to McBride. However, you know, what, what through our investigation, what I see is that's really the, the important habitat uh, area, I guess, from our perspective and what we've talked to uh, CPW about, is uh, having more uh, recreation opportunities generally on the east side of the property where we have lakes, where we have people fishing, uh, parking lots, uh, uh, county road, we have more activity. And then uh, really, probably as you go west, uh, that is that is more for the, the, the conservation purpose Correct. there. That's my perspective on, on the discussion that we've had uh, is uh, more public recreation opportunities really on the on the east side of that in the vicinities of, of the two lakes. I, th yep. I think the concern is with Fisher's Peak developing as just a state park with the ability to have mountain bike trails developed significantly, mm -hmm. that Raton will lose out on the ability to benefit from a connection into Fisher's Peak State Park from, from the east access from the east via mountain bike and even if it's a single trail even if it's just one trail um to to go along there and then jaunt up into fisher's peak i think i think that is the thorn in my uh behind that that you won't consider um and 
And so we're going to lose out on any economic development that Fisher's Peak may have, uh, or at least we, we're going to wave to them as, as they move forward and we stagnate. Sure. No, I, I understand your concern there. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought there was some property that was purchased west of that to try to be able to provide a connector trail just for what you're talking about where so we wouldn't have to go through a different access through the wildlife area right. so I, I think that connector trail can still be achieved um i not, wi not wildlife from isn't lake Dor not, not from lake, lake dorothy, dorothy no lake dorothy. but again wildlife isn't in the trail building business right i'm i'm here to protect conserve and manage wildlife well, and I think that's and I get your concern, totally understand it, but... I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about, is that the, the, the um, paperwork you produce yourself says hiking is not a an, an state wildlife area concern. They really don't like hiking. And that's in, that hiking has been allowed on SWAs, but it's not intended, it's not an intended use of the property. You're, you're putting wildlife first, people second, and from a Raptonian's point of view, because we're so used to Lake Maloya and Sugar Eat, and also 17 years of free access to Lake Dorothy before you restricted that, we want human access equal to or above the wildlife management that you're proposing. I think that's sure. The, the bottom line. Yeah, no, and I, I get that perspective wholeheartedly. Yeah, don't, don't misunderstand me there, and I, I respect that. Um, but you know, here's, here's the counter to that, right? Is if we, if we took this entire landscape, right. And we start with one connector trail and then let's say in 10 years, you know, somebody's like, well, it'd be really cool to have another mountain bike trail. And then they put another trail in and then another five years, there's another trail. And the next thing you know, the whole landscape and the whole wildlife area, which isn't our wildlife area, it's, you know, belongs to the city of Raton is fragmented, right? And so then you've got trails all over it. And, and that's, that's been proven. That's happened in time, right? Not just with trails and biking, but with land use changes, with oil and gas development. And what ends up happening in the end, right? There's one thing that loses, and that's wildlife and those wildlife species that call that property home. And so you can do that for so long. But eventually, over time, you know, you, you come to a pivotal moment where if you don't protect it, you're left with nothing. And so when you think about these management decisions and what you have to do, you can't just look at it for today and that immediate need. You got to look ahead to the future, you know, 50 years, 100 years, right? And, and the increased population growth and the increased demands on recreation. And let's be honest, you know, Colorado's supposed to quadruple, I think, over the next 10 years. I don't know what, what Raton or New Mexico is supposed to do, but... Um, those are all things, I guess, that we have to consider. And so it's not that we, we don't want to do that or we're not trying to just cater to one user group, but it, it goes right back to the main primary purpose of a wildlife area and what they were set up to do and how they're funded, right, and, and what we try to manage them for. So thank you, though. That part of the world, the terrain, take care of a lot of those new trails. Yeah, you're right. The terrain does take care of a lot of it, right? Yeah. The train will take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> may I make, Mr. Mayor, may I make one comment? Sure. So just one comment to, um, just to clarify something. So I don't know if anyone's had a chance. It just came out. I haven't even had a chance to look at the final uh, master plan it's, uh, for Fisher's Peak State Park. It's up for public input right now. And the last time I was there and we talked about it, they didn't plan any trail connectivity that direction. And they're going to they're gonna have seasonal closures on that end as well. So it's not, it's not going to necessarily look like what other areas of Fisher Peak State Park looks like. They're looking to connect to New Mexico in a different area as well. Because they, they have, they are heavily managing um, Fisher Peak State Park for conservation and for wildlife in addition to recreation. So I, even if we, you know, thought, okay, let's just go for it and put in the trail, I don't know that they would allow us to connect there into their park, if that, if that makes sense. I just wanted to add that in. You can currently submit any questions yep. or input in that master plan. Uh, there is a link for that. I think it's yeah. a month, a two month long period. Yeah. FisherSpeakStatePark.com, I think, is their, their website. Yeah, that's a great point. I appreciate that. Thanks for bringing that up, Lori. And, and again, right, my counterparts on the park side, 
you know, we are working with them to do just that and look at those same type of closures, even though it's a park that's still, I guess, within my area or my supervision, my region that I oversee. And, you know, and again, it, it goes back to, to looking at this in the future, right, and, and what's right for wildlife, still trying to balance all the different needs and demands from recreation. Okay, Mike, I yep. think uh, right now uh, we're going to move into the, we've got to move into our regular meeting. Okay. He, he is going to be here for the regular meeting. We have got one item that we have got to address in the special meeting. And we'll take a Perfect. brief recess and we'll get started. Thank you for your time on that. Can I ask you one question before you step down? Yes, sir. Is it, is it a fact that to get to the top of Fisher's Peak, the only way is through Jim Johns Canyon up onto the rim? And that there used to be way back in the 60s, there was a, there was a, like a trail road, a jeep, which was really hard to get to the top of Fisher's Peak. I would have to look at a map to verify that. 100%. And, and if such is the case, then it, in the future, what's going to happen if they want to go to the top of Fisher's Peak, they got to come through Sugar Reed Canyon. So I, that's just how what I had yeah. been told, and I just I, wanted to find I out. I believe that's correct. I just hate to comment on that without sure. being able to say 100%. Sure. Ron, just for your information, yeah. I'd love to see what the agenda was for Los Angeles County, and it's already on their agenda to close off that road. That starts at the County Road 9, goes into Colorado, the one that they just used for the bike ride, 85.5. They're closing that road. It's on the agenda to close that road. Well, you know, they tried to do that a, a couple of years ago, and they had like 2,000 people at the meeting, and they stopped that. They didn't get to shut it down. Colorado wouldn't let them. So, okay, let's, uh, Thank you. Let's I move just wanted the, to bring it. Sure. We have one item on this, on the agenda after the presentation. And that's the vote rate and act on the Raton Water Board recommendation to the Raton City Commission to approve the Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Lease Agreement. This is not the lease agreement that we're approving right here. This is a record we are acting on a recommendation from the Raton Water Board. Mr. Litchfield, yes. would you like to address us, sir? Well, um, we have not been able to convene Okay, so this is your first presentation of this, of the, the lease agreement? The lease agreement was given to me a day or two ago. My, quest, my uh, concern is uh, I need a validly constituted meeting to consider this issue and then make, deliberate, vote. Coming. All righty. So I'm not then probably going to hear it in a motion to rec to recommend this at this time. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of the way it's been handled, hasn't it? Well, then we are going to adjourn and take a quick recess and we will come back to the Raton regular commission meeting. <coughs> We'll be a couple minutes, we'll run a couple minutes later. <laughs> we'll get there.